Hello everyone, welcome to my talk, One Project, Different Angles. My name's Christine. Um, I work at Isovalent and I do some open source development. A lot of my passion is around Gateway API actually, but um, Cilium Project as a whole is something that I'm very passionate about as well as open source. Um, prior to Isovalent, I worked at Google doing similar stuff around uh, other networking stuff and Antho Service Mesh. So. Um, that's a little bit about me. Outside of work, I like to run a lot um, and rock climb, so two sports where I don't necessarily have to talk to people. And today I'm gonna be talking to you guys about um, Cilium, some main concepts around Cilium and use cases. So caveat, this is a beginner's talk, so you know, don't expect to go deep into the weeds around Cilium, but you know, this is just to like dip your toe in and get familiar with some of the uh, Cilium concepts because I'm sure if you're new to the CNCF or cloud native just in general, you've probably heard about some different like buzzwords of Cilium, eBPF, and um, this will just hopefully get your uh, initial knowledge into what Cilium is and what it can do for you from a security perspective as well. So what is Cilium? At its core, Cilium is built around a Linux kernel technology called eBPF, and eBPF stands for Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. So that's something that's been shipped out with the Linux kernel, I think version 4.19 around there. And so it allows you to have security, visibility, and networking control within the Linux kernel. And it makes the kernel programmable, so a lot of people describe it the equivalent of JavaScript for the browser, so it makes you the ability to have programs within your kernel. So that obviously has a lot of benefits to it. And some key BPF concepts that I'm gonna talk about are BPF programs and BPF maps. Programs are where the logic resides of how you actually program the kernel. And then BPF maps are kind of like the data structures which hold the logic of what your programs are having. And so this is not an eBPF talk, but it's a very in-depth, like it's, it's gonna scratch the surface for it. And so if you're thinking, hmm, this Linux kernel, you can just upload whatever program you want in it, that's good. I'm glad that you guys have uh, some good skepticism that's healthy in the security side of things. There's also an eBPF verifier, so that checks that there's no like infinite loops that are just running. So there are some security aspects around before you can just run random arbitrary code into your kernel. And if you want some more uh, lore behind eBPF, there's two talks that I do recommend. Um, there's the Cilium story, which is from uh, CiliumCon, I think, from one or two years ago, so it's still kind of relevant. And then there's also an eBPF documentary, which goes behind like how uh, Brendan Gregg, Alexi, um, and Daniel Borgman all contributed to eBPF and getting that into the kernel. So, Cilium is a CNCF graduated project. So, graduated is the final step after Sandbox. Um, so, it has been around the ecosystem for a while, and it leverages eBPF capabilities. So, it's been described a lot as a Swiss Army knife because it does a lot of stuff, and it's not just a CNI anymore, which stands for Container Network Interface. So, there are some general buckets that I like to have. Um, as an understanding. So like when I first started out learning Selim, this is kind of what I wish someone showed me instead of just like throwing me at the docks and then just like staring at nice examples that were like unkept for years. Well, anyways. Um, so I would say that Selim has some general buckets that um, you can group into networking, observability, and security. Now, I think Cilium does a lot more than just these three things, but these are like the general aspects of how I want you to think about stuff when starting out initially. So under the networking side of things, you have the CNI, which is what Cilium initially started out for, so that handles all like the networking plumbing, making sure that your pods can connect to each other and communicate with each other, and that stands for Container Network Interface. Um, it also has a Cilium service mesh, so that's pushing upwards to a per node proxy instead of just residing at the L3, L4 layer, which is where the CNI resides. And then it also has observability. I think Hubble is a great tool. It allows you to peer into your connection flows between your pods, and I think it has a good, simple interface, um, both as a CLI and a UI to just 
have good observability into it. It's not that much overhead as well. So if you want to start with Cilium and getting some more uh, metrics and logs into your cluster, I would say start off with Hubble. And then lastly, we have Tetragon, which is kind of like the focal point of what security is. Um, as we saw in the keynote this morning, there was, um, the, yeah, Cilium has graduated as a security project in the CNCF, so Tetragon is like a tried and true tested um, security tool in the ecosystem. So you're probably wondering, how does this really all work? At a high level, every single node in your cluster is running a Cilium agent, and the Cilium agent is based on the Envoy project, if you're familiar with that, but it's kind of like a stripped down version of that so we can leverage a lot of the cool features that Envoy has, but having it run on each node in your cluster. And so on your behalf, it will uh, do a lot of the updating, um, responsible for watching the Kube API server and any Kubernetes related events that are happening. And then also it manages the eBPF programs for you. So we kind of like took Envoy and made it into a Cilium agent, which benefits from the eBPF side of things. Okay, so now we're gonna go into each of the buckets. So get ready. We're gonna talk about the networking side of things first. And so what I kind of hope to do is talk about different um, custom resources or different features that Cilium has that you may not be familiar with. Um, because it's like, I can talk about sure CNIs and what they do, but kind of want to show you some YAML, but I'm not going to get into a demo. I feel like we've already had a lot of demos today. People are really risking it with the demo gods, and so I don't want to, you know, try my luck. But anyways, so first off, a simple feature that you can try with uh, Cilium in the networking aspect to increase your security is encryption. Um, between your endpoints or your pods, you can easily enable encryption with either IPsec or WireGuard. And here's just the installation of the simple Cilium. Um, I also did upload these slides. I finally got sketch.com to uh, merge my accounts because it's been a mess. But Anyways, these slides are online, so don't feel the pressure to uh, take pictures, but this is the Helm command to just install. So you can see that you just have to en enable encryption and what type of encryption tool you want. So I'd be or WireGuard. And then this is the alternative Cilium CLI tool. Um, you can install the Cilium CLI from GitHub. It's a very nice uh, tool that you can just, you know, peer into your uh, Cilium agents and look at some debug points, but this is how you would do the installation for that, and it's the same, same. Um, another good thing that Cilium has is network policies. So because it's a CNI initially, all uh, CNIs have their own network policies that they can have implemented. And so it's kind of just a way of allowing you to say, hey, these pods can are, are allowed to communicate with these other pods. And each CNI plugin has its own flavor, so um, I think a good resource to try out is the editor network policy IO. That's a good way to like look at a plain uh, network policy for Kubernetes and then also map it over to a Cilium network policy if you are interested in that. So you can uh, test that out there. But the Cilium network policy in itself is pretty robust, I would say. It works at the uh, layer three to layer seven, but we're gonna kind of slice it down a little bit. So for layer three and four, you can specify how uh, each like how each entities inside the Cilium Kubernetes ecosystem is talking to each other. So for the layer three, you can specify based on endpoints, IP ciders, blocks, and services. And then if you go up one layer, you can specify next ports and protocols. So you can see here, the part in the YAML that I'm circling there, you're specifying which endpoint uh, can be allowed to talk to each other. So the ingress, sorry, these colors are really not ideal for this lighting here, but the ingress is what is allowed to um, go into the entity that's labeled the, with the role backend there. And so if you want to enable a service mesh as well, because Cilium also offers service mesh capabilities, you can enforce, um, some HTTP and other infrastructure application logic within the same Cilium network policy. So instead of having to adopt a new custom resource of a different ecosystem, you can kind of just layer on, which is nice. 
Um, and in a service mesh, if you're not familiar with it, is an infrastructure piece that deals with application logic, so being aware of like headers, for example. And so at the layer seven, you can uh, do some filtering based on traffic paths, methods, hosts, and headers. And so that's pretty good because then you can't just post arbitrarily to some random path. You can be really prescriptive on what you're allowed to do. And then also with the service mesh, you have mutual authentication. This is a beta feature though. I do really want to emphasize that, but uh, mutual authentication is the making sure that two parties are authenticated with each other. And so once that authentication is complete, you can allow communication to flow between it. So it's best to use it with encryption such as WireGuard. Um, and the way that kind of works at a high level is that each Cilium ID is mapped over to a Spiffy ID. And a Cilium ID is basically how um, Cilium maps over um, like deployments into like pods of the same label map over to gather in Cilium's logical standpoint. And so it has X509 certificates and leverages the Spiffy Spire um, CNCF project. And there's a Spire server in a um, per node Spire agent. And so it establishes a chain of trust before um, communication is allowed. So I would say try it out, but it's in beta again. Okay, the next bucket that we're gonna go into is observability. I think this one is definitely one of the higher like easier things to digest as well because it's kind of just like you're ingesting the logs and you're looking at something versus being more hands-on and having to write out policies. So Cilium has a great project called Hubble and you can see from a security perspective, you can observe which services are connected to which ones and then who has been accessing certain services from outside the cluster. And essentially it's a way to monitor your system. Um, so the way that this works is that you have Hubble installed as well in your cluster, and then you can get metrics based on an API, a CLI tool as well, and also the UI. So um, there, we all love metrics, of course, so things like Grafana, Prometheus can display them in a really rich format. And the, this is just a screenshot of the Hubble UI, but you can see how different um, workloads have different um, capabilities and then you can also see at the bottom there you can have filtering based on certain protocols um, and then you can also see if things are dropped or if connections are allowed to pass through. And I think this is a really good tool that leverages network policies as well so you can see which ones are dropped. So for example, if you are filtering dropped traffic for this simple YAML file which is allowing um, pods with the label front end to communicate to the label back end. You can observe it with the CLI tool, for example, and you can see that the policy has been dropped. So that's pretty nice and it's pretty usable as well. You can do a lot of the filtering within the policies and within traffic. And then also, you can also do filtering based on the L7 network policies as well. So for example, mutual authentication, the feature that I was talking about earlier with the service mesh, you just have to um, enable it with authentication mode required in your YAML file in the same Cilium network policy. And then you can also filter based on that. And you can see in the filters here, um, there is author an authorization part at the end where it's specifying what certificate management tool is being used. So in this case, Spire. All right, we're in the last bucket here. So security enforcement, which is I think probably the most important focal point around this. Um, so Tetragon is a project that's pretty well known in this ecosystem. It deals with detecting, reporting, and preventing malicious attacks while your workloads are running. So it's not something that is static, it's dynamic. So it can act upon events pretty fast and it's really powerful. And Tetragon, similar to Cilium and Hubble, has uh, dedicated agents that run on each node, which is how it's able to monitor uh, and react to events. So Tetragon is a runtime enforcement and security and observability tool in the ecosystem. And it hooks onto Linux kernel functions and can to be deployed with uh, Cilium or without. So that's something I think not a lot of people are familiar with. If you don't 
have a Kubernetes cluster, but you still want to leverage Tetragon and have like, I don't know, if someone's editing this file, like kill this process immediately, you can do that and not be in a Kubernetes cluster or you don't also need to install Cilium, you know? So it's pretty nice. Um, so it allows for transparency to applications. Um, it's pretty minimal, so it doesn't take a lot to stand up and it's quite simple in how it's used. Um, so three important concepts from Tetragon's point of view that you should probably be aware of is events, tracing policies, and enforcement. Um, so events are exposed via, via JSON or gRPC endpoints, and that's how you get your data from Tetragon. Uh, your tracing policy is kind of the custom resource that allows you to trace kernel events from um, hook points and certain selectors, and we're gonna go a little bit more about that. And lastly, enforcement is how you're going to act upon certain traced events. So uh, the last two really go hand in hand on how you can act upon events. And then lastly, there are some good integrations as well. Of course, like I said earlier, we all love logs. People who are, are like our VPs and stuff, they also love logs. So uh, there's good Prometheus, Grafana integrations. Um, and you can see that open telemetry is also there, so it's pretty beneficial for having that aggregated component of having logs and being able to track appropriately. And so this is an example of a tracing policy with Tetragon. Um, so the first part here is the mandatory data that you need. You need obviously the API, the kind, um, the metadata, so you can distinguish which tracing policy you're talking to. Um, and then next up, you have your hook point. And so these are things like the kernel probes or K probes, um, and they are highly tied to your kernel version, but it enables you to dynamically hook into your kernel function and execute um, BPF code. And if you don't know what you're able to touch, there's um, documentation on how to just check one of the Linux file systems to see what you're allowed to call from this hook point, and then you can just like grep for something. Um, trace points are stable across different kernel versions, and so those are different events that you can hook onto that are pretty stable, and you can do, uh, it's portable across different kernels. And then lastly, uh, uprobes, which are user space functions, um, which you can use Tetragon to hook onto those. So obviously you have to be careful because it depends on the architecture that you're running. Okay, and the last part here is the selectors. So obviously, when you hook onto a certain point inside the kernel, it probably it's gonna throw back a bunch of information at you. Um, selectors is the way of how you kind of narrow down what data you wanna parse through. And so it extracts a subset of events based on different properties that you can uh, specify, and then also optionally, like I was mentioning before, um, any things that you want, like how you act upon a certain event from happening. So again, if someone is um, modifying a file or accessing a certain directory, you can just immediately send a seek kill to uh, signal that the process is over. <laughs> um, and something else that's really cool with Tetragon is that there's a lot of work being done into Kubernetes, Kubernetes policy tracing. So this is also another beta feature but it's uh, the ability to do namespace policy, pod label filtering, and container field filtering. So no longer is it just gonna be dedicated to like accessing files or um, certain socket protocols or something that's accessing, making certain connections, you can now do it more Kubernetes aware. All right, a lot of talking, but some wrap up I think for the next steps of getting more used to Cilium or more familiar around it would be to check out the docs. I think actually, like I've been around this cloud native ecosystem for a few years now. Um, and I would say that the Cilium docs and the Tetragon docs hold pretty well. They have some pretty good examples. Um, whereas like some other projects, who of course it's like kind of, uh, it's tough to read sometimes, but I think there's good examples. And also inside the repository, there are a lot of sample YAMLs that are pretty intuitive. And we love our like Star Wars demo because I feel like people can really relate to uh, like the Death Star and <laughs> TIE Fighters. And so I think that's a good way to map over the logic as well. Here are some links around uh, the GitHub repository. So Cilium has its own, Tetragon also has its own. 
Um, if you have any questions around Cilium, the Slack channel is pretty friendly, um, and there's different um, channels that you can ask questions, such as like end users or specific ones around like service mesh. So I think that's a good place to throw your question because there's a lot of people who use Cilium. And then lastly, if you want to get involved, we would love for any feedback. I was already mentioning some beta features like mutual authentication and also the Kubernetes policy filtering. If you guys could even just try it out and then if you run into any issues and um, you want to get involved with the project but don't know how, I think opening an issue, it helps out us a lot as a project and then it also makes our project stronger and more resilient in the future. You guys bring a different perspective than what we look at all day, so any help is appreciated. And now, if you want something that's maybe more use case centric, um, CNCF has a blog post dedicated to actual specific use cases of certain companies using certain um, tools in the ecosystem. So here are some samples of what Cilium has. Um, so for example, if you're a bank and you need some more, I don't know, like a more robust setup around encryption or something like that, you can check out other um, companies that are in a similar position to you and see how they handled their, um, I guess, uh, cloud native adoption. And so if you do want to try um, some of these features out, there's labs on isovalent.com slash labs. If you come by the isovalent booth, there's some really nice folks. We have a project manager actually there from uh, for, for the Tetragon team. So if you want some more questions around Tetragon specific stuff, you can uh, ask for that at the, uh, at the isovalent booth. Um, again, come out to the open source community if you have any questions, if you're not ready to adopt it fully, but you want to try it out. Um, and then also eBPF, you don't have to be necessarily an expert to use um, Cilium in eBPF because Cilium does a good job of abstracting away a lot of the complexity, but um, if you want to learn more, eBPF.io is a great place to look. All right, and with that, all, that being said, if you have any questions, my name's Christine. You can find me, I'll be around. Um, and yeah, thank you.